So for you uh, newbies here at Startup Grind, we do have another tradition, and that is uh, when I introduce our amazing guest, um, I would like everybody to stand up and cheer as loud as you possibly can, and as if, say, I don't know, the Cubs win tonight. Thanks for coming out, by the way, despite the fact the Cubs are on right now. Um, so are you guys ready for this? So set everything down that you've got. All right. All right, everybody, let's give it up for Christy Ross. Thank you. I know that can be a little bit unnerving, but uh, kind of gets things going. I like it. Yeah. So um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me here. And I just want to say that um, tonight uh, it's all about you. So, uh, but one way that I like to start out so we get to understand who you are and all of that, um, tell us about where you grew up, um, what kinds of things were you thinking and doing as a kid, and maybe there was just an inkling of an entrepreneur in there somewhere or what have you, but uh, tell us. Um, so first of all, that was a very long time ago, if I go all the way back to uh, my childhood. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I could probably do it even without this. Um, but I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, yes, I like cheese. Yes, I like the Packers. Um, don't throw <coughs> anything at me. Um, uh, and I love the Cubs, and so again, I'm gonna thank you guys for coming out tonight too. Uh, if there's somebody in the audience that wants to give us an update every 10 minutes on what the score is, just let me know. <laughs> um, I'll come hand you the microphone. Uh, so, grew up in Wisconsin and had uh, two parents that had an amazing work ethic. Hmm. Truly an amazing work eth ethic. Um, my dad in particular, uh, he actually attempted to start two different companies. Um, and just small companies, but it was it was one of those things that I think um, was probably foundational for me to be able to see him go from ideation to actually doing what he was thinking, hmm. and uh, so that was kind of cool. So I was literally like in grade school. Um, is this where you want me to go? Yeah, Childhood, no, that absolutely. kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. um, that's good. In uh, in grade school, so I, you know whatever third grade fourth grade and I'd get up before the sun up before the sun with him before he went to work and I'd sit at the breakfast table and and he'd talk about his ideas and I'd talk about mine and I had a couple plans they were all like pictures and stuff like that <laughs> right but it, but it was really cool to be able to um, you know interact at that level it gave me confidence to basically feel like I could do anything anything I decide to do I could actually do and and it also <laughs> taught me it was okay to fail you know, yeah. he still got up every morning, and, and when the first business didn't go through, um, again, he was still holding down two other jobs. Uh, it, uh, you know, it, it instilled something in me that I probably didn't even realize was there yeah. until, you know, much later. Yeah. So. Oh, that's a great story. So where'd you go to school? Where'd you go to college? Went to school at uh, St. Norbert up in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Packerland. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. And what, what, when you graduated from college, what was your, what were your, what were you thinking about? I mean, were you thinking about starting something up or was it, I'm going to head right into the grind or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what was? So, so, um, without getting too personal, I'll share one other thing sort of about my childhood, which has shaped me. Um, my parents got divorced when I was in fifth grade, so I was 10 years old. Uh, and my mom passed away from breast cancer when I was in high school. And so I was basically in a situation where I, I had to, you know, there was no, um, there was no failing. It was, yeah. it was kind of fight or flight. And I realized that, boy, I need some foundational, uh, I, I need some foundational uh, financial experience. Hmm. Um, I, was, I was a really good student. I was, um, I uh, did very well in math. I liked it. I, I excelled at it. And so I think that uh, you know, going off to college, I had to go find grants and scholarships and apply for all of that with really, you know, essentially no parental guidance yeah. on that. And so I think that that, uh, that alone, it's kind of that you know, fight or flight sort yeah. of uh, mentality. And 
I'm a fighter. I'm highly, highly competitive. <laughs> so, I mean, at that point in time, I, I, we all sort of know, and we'll get to this point, um, what you're doing today and what your company does. I, I want you to explain that, though. But um, did you start thinking about financial stuff? Mm -hmm. I mean, was that kind of your mindset? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, and at that age, a lot of people aren't thinking about that. Um, but I, my parents, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. And so it was one of those things I said, I am not going to live check to check. I am going to figure this out. I'm going to make money. So when I, went, when I went off to school, I thought, OK, what, do, what, what can I be that's going to make the most money the day I step out of college? <laughs> and yeah. so that was accounting and finance. Um, you know, without having to go on for an extra degree or whatever. And so I just wanted to be able to have that financial security right, you know, right out of the gates. So financial literacy and um, that financial security was so important to me that a lot of those decisions that I made along the way through college, um, you know, were based on that. Yeah. So we talked a little bit before this that um, I was the worst employee ever <laughs> in a company where, you know, you do well and then you get bored and then you kind of move on. So... Tell us about that kind of experience. I mean, when you're coming out of school, you know, you get that first gig, yeah. and you're going to take the world by storm. You know, what, what kinds of things were you thinking and doing? And did you feel like, you know, this isn't right for me? Or, you know, what, what, was, what were you sort of thinking about? Yeah, I, um, when I went into public accounting, and a lot of people look at me and they go, oh, my god, she's an accountant. Um, you know, that was my, that was my base. I, 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 you know, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I didn't have somebody to explain what that day was going to look like. You know, now they have these career days, and you can go see it firsthand, and, and, and. I didn't have that opportunity. Wish I would have. Um, uh, but I, I, the, the beautiful thing in, in choosing the, uh, the path I chose is I was able to be exposed to so many different companies mm. and to be able to really see their financials, which, is, which I look at that as like their report cards, right? Who's doing well? Why are they doing well? What are they doing? And it, it forced me to kind of, not even forced me, it just, I have a, a you know, in a, um, sense to just ask why or what if you did this? And I found myself with, um, some of our clients like strategically wanting to get involved and before I knew it um, you know I was off and, and I was a CFO for one of our clients um, at the ripe old age of 25 so wow. just three years into um, public accounting uh, you know I stepped out and worked for uh, for a client but but to talk about the the boredom I'm I get bored very easily and I, I need multiple things going on or if I make a choice it has to have sort of uh, multi-purpose or multi multiple benefits from it and so that was, uh, you know, that was one of those things that um, even taking that CFO role at a young age, yeah. I found I got bored very easily. Went through um, uh, a merger and acquisition and uh, expanded uh, to multiple locations. We had 6,000 employees. But I, then I'm like, okay, what's next? I need something more. So um, after that, I ended up going back into public accounting, starting my own practice. Um, shared office space with other CPAs and attorneys and um, wanted to be closer to uh, the financial markets again. The one thing I didn't say is a lot of the clients that I worked on when I first came out of college in my first uh, you know, CPA role is I worked with a lot of uh, in the financial services team. So I worked with traders and brokerage mm. firms and advisors and I was like, oh, like that's yeah. so exciting, right? So to be able to get back into that was, um, was awesome and, and exciting. Were there, I mean, it's amazing that you were a CFO at age 25. I mean, what were some of the challenges you faced at that young of an age with, you know, the proverbial C-suite, you know, mm -hmm. in your title? Um, how was that? What was the experience like? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where I think, you know, that, um, that foundational aspect that my dad instilled in me that I didn't really know is uh, I had something to say. And if I had something to say, he used to, he used to listen. That meant that I felt like what I had to say was worth something, right? Yeah. And so when I was at the table at a very young age in a, in a, in a C-suite, um, 
uh, they, you know, they were still looking to me for my advice, um, mm. the two founders, and um, talking through because they weren't financial, they didn't have a financial background. So, you know, just in those few, few years and with my degree, uh, you know, I figured I'll bring whatever I can to the table. I, I learned a lot. Um, I made some mistakes, uh, and that was okay too. Nothing, you know, made the company crumble. But I, I really also reached out and connected with a number of people that I that I met along the way, that I met in those first three years of um, you know being in the corporate world. Yeah. Well, there. I mean, speaking of that, I mean, were there um, mentors that you would yeah. kind of rely upon and and tell us about you know one or more of your mentors and how they how they helped you? Yeah. De definitely. Um, so one of the first. Um, one of my first mentors in, uh, in, in my first job out of college, he said within the first week of starting, he said, opportunity is all around you. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those moments where I'm like, oh, my God. He's like, you can meet somebody standing in line you know, for coffee. You can end up meeting someone sitting next to you tonight, literally, that can ultimately end up being a catalyst to change your world, to change your path, to connect you to somebody else. I mean, that was one of those things that I you know, learned early on that has stuck with me. But, but the one thing that I kind of added on top of that was nobody's going to drop it in your lap. You need to grab it. You need to take that opportunity. You need to look for it, pay attention, and actually grab it. And I think that was probably one of the best things that, that he ever, you know, ever taught me. That's awesome. Did you did you end up taking that first company to some sort of exit or transaction? Or? So the first company, so I, I um, when I was CFO, you mean? Yeah. No, I left yeah. um, to actually go start my own practice. That's right. That's so, right. Uh, and then from there, again, um, got involved with the traders and the advisors and the brokerage firms once again, um, started to have children. And I'll say for the women in the audience, you know, and men too, listen, it's, it's, it's an equal playing field out there. Making that sort of life choice, um, I, I didn't stay home. I made the choice to continue my career. Uh, but I knew I needed to make a mindful choice because having your own business, particularly like in a practice like law or like, you know, accounting, you have multiple, multiple bosses, <laughs> you're, right. right? I mean, all your clients, yes, they're your customers, but you're, you're also answering to, to each one of them. So, uh, so I, I had another opportunity to become a CFO mm -hmm. uh, once again um, with one of my clients, uh, and I took that opportunity. And it was also exciting because it was in the financial services industry. So I was the CFO for a stock specialist firm on the Chicago Stock Exchange floor, the second largest. Wow. So, yeah, it was really – I loved that move. Tell us a little bit about kind of the – and I, I don't know if I like the term work-life balance, but I think it's important to understand. I mean, you're extremely successful, but you've also got three daughters I do. at home. So how do you, how do you manage that? Yeah. Um, so there's uh, anybody who says they have this wonderful work-life balance is lying. Mm. <laughs> it's, there's, there's no real balance. You always feel like, oh, I should be over there. Oh, I should be doing this. But you, you got to kind of live in the moment. Whatever you decide to do, wherever you are, put everything you have into it because you're going to get tenfold out of it. And so that's what I do with my kids too. If I say, I am leaving at this time, I am making it to their game, I am, I'm watching it from you know, beginning to end, I'm not picking up my phone, I'm, not, I'm, I'm watching her game. And I'll have my phone and I'll take pictures, but it's, it's all about making sure what you're doing, you're, you're focusing on, and you gotta, you gotta fit all of it in in some regards, and it's not a 50-50 balance, but the balance is, is if they feel too that you're giving them 100% of your time when you're with them, it's about quality, not quantity. Right, and if you're happy in what you're doing at work, if you're happy personally, um, and you know you have a good relationship with your kids and all that wonderful stuff, uh, that's what balance is to me. Yeah, that's awesome. So, how did you uh, get involved with Doe or what Tasty Trade slash Doe? Yeah. And uh, as you're telling the story, um, I would love for everybody to kind of understand what is the problem. Mm -hmm. you guys are solving mm -hmm. 
and how are you solving that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before I even jump into dough, uh, remember I have 25 years, not that I have to go through every year, but there's a, another leap I made in, in between uh, dough, what I'm doing right now, and when I was the CFO for a stock specialist firm. Um, because on that, that note of kids and balance, as I started to have little kids and needed to start to travel more, um, I needed to make a change. I needed to make a, um, a career change so I didn't have to travel as much and I could at least be in Chicago. And so I took another CFO position with Think or Swim. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. So Think or Swim, uh, anybody here familiar with Think or Swim? Okay. Oh yeah, cool. So, um, so I was the CFO for Thinkorswim, and we uh, essentially went through six mergers and acquisitions over six years. So, as CFO, I was very, very busy. It was exciting for me. I didn't get bored. Usually, that two to three year period, and I didn't yeah. get bored. There was enough going on. <laughs> yeah. um, but our last one was TD Ameritrade. So, TD Ameritrade bought us out, helped transition that, and one of the founders, uh, Tom Sosnoff, and um, uh, you know, had this crazy, I, I'll say crazy idea, but it was just, it was really, it was really fun. He wanted to make finance fun. And yes, that's an oxymoron, and I say that all the time because nobody really feels like finance is fun. Um, so I was, I, I loved that idea. And he, um, he said, I want to make it fun and, and, and actionable. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in, I'm in. Because yeah. he's, he's like, okay, um, let's do this, right? And uh, so we started Tasty Trade um, four years ago. So Tasty Trade is an online financial network, and we produce eight hours of live programming every day. And we talk about the financial markets um, ge geared towards uh, the do-it-yourself investor. So do-it-yourself investor is you and me, all of mm -hmm. us here. And uh, it's, we have 40 different shows. And we cover all the way from millennials to, you know, or appeal to millennials all the way to retirees, um, all the way from beginner to advanced. So really, um, you know, covering the span, but uh, particularly options trading. So a lot of people by now go, oh, that's just not me. And believe it or not, it's every one of you guys in this room. It's... Um, so it, you know, it was intriguing, and and trust me, we started with a completely different business model. Okay, we were gonna do a, um, we were gonna do a uh, kind of like an online radio show, hmm. and immediately I'm diving in, looking at video consumption, right? Okay, like this, going, right. okay, this is four years ago, and you look at it now, and it's like, okay, we better go buy some cameras <laughs> before right. we launch this thing, and and we did, and and launched with video. Um, that was the right choice. And about a year and a half into it, uh, you know, and, and I'll also say, we started out kind of heavy on the fun and, and lighter on the finance and realized, you know what, after a lot of customer feedback, we, we geared more towards more finance with just the right layer or flavor of fun. Um, and I want to talk about customer feedback a little bit too, and I'll, I'll do that in just a minute. But I think that kind of, uh, you know, about a year and a half into it, we, we decided we needed something more than just kind of one-dimensional shows. And we said, you know what? We've built financial technology before. Let's, let's do this again. <laughs> and we wanted to, so we made finance fun, made it actionable. Uh, we realized we needed to make it approachable, too, hmm. because there were so many different technology platforms out there that they, they all looked the same. A lot of numbers, a lot of charts. Uh, and we wanted to, you know, we wanted, again, to make it fun, make it engaging, make somebody actually want to come in and, and use the trading platform. So uh, on top of that, at that point, we also um, I did a lot of research around kind of the, the average age of a brokerage customer because we wanted to be able to make this a mass market product. I know it's not really a mass market product, but more mass market than it, you know, than it, than it has been historically. I mean, financial services and trading is a very closed, you know, tight-knit you know, community, really. And so we wanted to kind of open that up for, for many people. Uh, but building the, uh, you know, looking at the average age of a brokerage customer, realizing that um, there was what nobody was new entering. Age? It curious. was like 52, 53. Wow. Yeah. But when we looked at this, um, 
it was like 56, 57, depending upon what research you look at. And we were like, okay, nobody knew is entering this space. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody knew is 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 doing this. Um, so, and we weren't the only ones that were looking at this, going, hey, you know, this is an opportunity to capture the millennials, like everybody else out there right now, right? <laughs> Every right. marketing is to try to capture the millennials. But this was this was real. Um, and so we, uh, if you look at our Doe platform in comparison to a lot of other trading platforms, uh, dynamically different. It, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, um, it was it, really, that was the technology era. That was the online technology era. I mean, now we're, we're in the content era. We really are. And, and it's, um, you know, it's fun to be kind of in what's hot now. We were in it, what was hot in, at Thinkorswim. Um, now we're just kind of changing the game a little bit. So any technology, we're adding that content flavor throughout. So it's, it's really a 360 experience for our customer, which is what we wanted. You watch our shows, you can play along on our platform. And you, it's, actual, it's actually a, a visual trading platform. So you, um, it's not just the blinking numbers and, and you know, flashing lights and, and charts. So. Was there, I mean, at that point when you kind of uh, decided you were gonna produce kind of this technology, and has anybody checked out Doe, by the way? I mean, the user experience is off the charts. I mean, it's amazing. I have kind of this general rule, I call it the 770 rule, mm -hmm. that if you're 7 or 70, you should be able to figure out, yeah. you know, what it is. And yours, is, it's incredible. Oh, um, so in adding that, was there a critical addition to your team that really drove kind of the development of, of technology? Well, so I'll, I'll say this, uh, we came, our team that's together uh, has been together for almost a dozen years, so 11 or 12 years. So, so we had the core group um, from, you know, a core team that was at Thinkorswim as well. Oh, so, so you, did you bring your CTO? So or? we brought our CTO, ah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so it's one of those, we had, we had Tom Sosnoff, who was uh, one of the founders of Thinkorswim, uh, you know, one of the founders here, obviously, and, uh, and we brought our CTO, who's highly talented. But the, but the key I'm gonna say about that is your team members, your, you know, the people you work with, the culture you create, is, is all about the people you work with, right? Is all about the people you surround yourself with. And when you know that you can actually, you know, get along and you know how to work through issues and problems and, and build on each other's ideas, oh my God, like you feel like you, you hit the holy grail, right? It's like when you get married and, and you've actually married the right person. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. So, so um, in, in developing this whole thing, and you mentioned it quickly, but what kind of customer discovery or customer development did you go through and getting feedback yeah. um, to get to this amazing UX? Yeah. Oh my God, so I have to say, um, I'm so glad you brought that up because that has been a um, you know, core pillar of everything we do. We did it at Thinkorswim, um, providing sort of customers access to us. This is like tenfold, right? Because I mean, we're, you know, uh, we have on-air talent on air for eight hours a day, but we make sure that our customers feel like they can access all the on-air talent, any of us at all, passing out our email addresses, you know, all yeah. over the place. We'll take phone calls. You know, from, from customers, we want that feedback. It's not only about building access for your customers to you, it's about interacting with them. It's about actually having a conversation. It's about sort of going back and forth and, and, and understanding. You know, it's not a survey. It's not a cold survey to them. It's allowing them access, letting them know we want to hear what they have to say and, and actually doing something about it. I mean, some of our best ideas and, and have really come from, from customers. Uh, and so I would say that that's, you know, anybody who's starting a business and, um, you know, trying to make it work, having that sort of relationship with your customer is is priceless, absolutely priceless. So, I mean, you've been through uh, Think or Swim and incredibly successful exit, all of those things. You guys are on fire, we'll say. Doe is. Um, how do you how do you make that, or how do you sort of maintain the culture that you guys have created? Mm -hmm. It sounds like with that core team 
as you go through this high growth period. Mm -hmm. And maybe you did the same at Think or Swim and maybe share both of those stories and how you manage that. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, we keep a very flat organization, you know, and there's pluses and minuses to that, right? Because some people, uh, just like children, I mean, children like structure, right? You need to, you know, build some structure. They like that. But yet we wanted to keep it open enough and, and flat enough that everybody has a voice, that everybody, if they have an idea, they can, you know, they can be heard. And I think that's important. We, um, at Thinkorswim, we had, uh, we had 200 employees wow. um, before we were first, before we first merged with a, a different public company and then was ultimately, you know, bought out by TD Ameritrade. Yeah. But keeping that, even that, the 200 people uh, again, it was um, it was truly the focus of, of making sure people felt like they had a voice, mm -hmm. and we do that now. We have seventy five employees hmm. um, and continue to grow, but it's uh, you know it's like sending out a, a company email, uh, telling them all kind of what's going on this week, or if there's something coming up, sharing that, not waiting till the next you know kind of company meeting, which we, we should have more of, but it's like, you know what, listen, we can send an email, let you know what, what's going on. So everybody feels informed, like they feel like, you know, they're part of it. How do you, how do you find talent? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's always, um, it, that's, it's tough to do, right? Yeah. Uh, but I also think that sort of the, the, the networking, the connections, the, the keeping in contact with people that you've worked with over the years. I mean, it's amazing how many people, you know, come up through, uh, you know, different experiences and bring a lot to the table. So I think that's one thing. You know, universities, too, are, are phenomenal. They want to place, they want to place their individuals. We have highly, highly talented people here right in Chicago. What is it? 145,000 kids graduate every yeah. year from like a university or college here in and around Chicago. That, wow. That's amazing, right? So, so to be able to tap into them, um, you know, don't, I wouldn't ignore that. And now some of the other things I think are fabulous, like Northwestern, you know, mm -hmm. they just launched the garage. Yeah. Uh, sort of teaching and, and um, uh, nurturing entrepreneurship and helping them think about that sort of approach, I think is, I think is amazing. Yeah, I think, uh, well, University of Chicago launched the Chicago Innovation Exchange. Same yep. sort of concept mm -hmm. where they're fostering that. Yep. So where, where are you guys going from here? I mean, I know you've, you've gotten some serious funding. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going through a growth phase. I mean, what's, what's, what's the ultimate? Right. Um, well, I think if it was up to Tom, he's going to die in his chair delivering his show every day. Has any, <laughs> Placing his last seen trade. His show? Has anybody seen his show? <laughs> you got to check it out. I mean, it's incredible. It's fantastic. Um, one of the shows we do is, is bootstrapping in America as yeah. well. So it's also an entrepreneurial in the same, in the same sort of spirit. But, it's, but a lot of it's trading-related and market-related. Um, and, it, again, we have, you know, shows for beginners or uh, we have – anybody know Rachel Fox? Anybody watch Desperate Housewives? Or, so we actually signed her on. She, was, she started trading at, like, 16 on her own. We uh, brought her on to actually be part of a, a series we were doing called Step Up to Options. So if you ever traded a, a stock, you actually, we actually sort of um, step you into learning and understanding everything that we teach around kind of this logical, mechanical approach. Um, but anyway, so that was, sorry, that was a side thing that I think oh, no, is, is awesome. great to um, know. But so what's next for us? So we are continuing to expand our, our talent pool. Does anybody know Dylan Radigan um, from MSNBC? And yeah, so um, we brought Dylan Radigan on to do uh, some additional shows with us, kind of called Truth or Skepticism, um, which was cool because it was taking a risk. You know, we're out there teaching a, this logical mechanical approach to investing using options, okay? And just to give you a quick spiel, if you buy stock, we believe you have a 50-50 chance of making money. It could go up, it could go down. And, the, and we believe that because there are so many different things and so many different factors in the market that could affect that public company stock price. And being a public company at one point, mm -hmm. totally, you have no control. There's so many things that can set it off in a different direction. We were printing cash, and our stock was plummeting at one point. And, of course, it was 2008. Um, but I'm just saying that there are so many different factors, you, you just don't know. Anyway, 
so we teach options. So like if a, a stock stays in this range for a period of time, you, we actually teach you how to collect premium for that. So we increase your probability of success by using options in your trading portfolio. So, um, so I was uh, talking about adding people to our mix, adding more talent um, in one of, the, one of the paths that we're taking. We brought Dylan Radigan in to, to basically you know, test it, to basically come in, your, your, your typical you know, financial media spokesperson who he's been for many, many years, um, very animated, uh, has strong opinions, and we put him you know, face to face, uh, head to head with Tom, and we said, this is a, you know, we're taking a risk. <laughs> this could go very bad. <laughs> oh wait, this was like live? It was like, live. Oh my God. Yeah, live. Yeah. And we didn't, but we believe in what we are doing. We, you know, we've, we've lived this, we've breathed this, we understand it, we believe in it, or we wouldn't be teaching people how to do it. Um, but we're not, you know, so he came in and, and guess what? We converted him. Not because we paid him to be converted, but it was all honesty on the table. It's fully transparent. And so it's been really fun to sort of go through that and see that we can not only convert a, um, you know, an 18 year old stock trader, right? Uh, and a, you know, I think he's 42, he's younger than I am. He, uh, you know, financial, you know, figurehead, right? So anyway, so adding more talent um, to finish your, your uh, question, we're also, we've also expanded globally. So we've expanded into Canada. Um, we recently expanded into Singapore. Um, two weeks ago, we, we sent our first video over to China. Oh my God, <laughs> it was so hard. It was just to get the video uploaded on the other side, I think took four days. <laughs> wow. So it was really, it was really interesting. And it's, we'll see where that goes. So sort of a global expansion with our content. So, so on the Tasty Trade side, um, you know, actually taking uh, is some of the actual technology and regulatory side of it uh, to other countries is, is far more challenging. But, but we'll get there too. Yeah, I mean, that's gotta be challenging and thinking about just any product when you're taking it from here to there in particular content. Mm -hmm. So how do, I mean, how, how do you translate Tom, mm -hmm. who's this very, you know, I don't know how you would describe him, but unique individual. But how do you translate that literally and figuratively to China or Italy or mm -hmm. Germany or? Yeah, so what we've done, so we have a research team. You know, we have, with 75 employees, right, we have about 20, um, 20 or so that are developers and designers. Um, and we have, uh, we have um, a research team, which is about tw another 12. And so that research team uh, puts out a number of different segments. And so we hand select some of these segments that, that are um, put out there. So it, you know, we, we, um, we translate them. So we have someone on staff that, that speaks Chinese. Um, we've also uh, have someone on staff who uh, is fluent in Spanish. We've done some Spanish pieces. So it's... Um, when it comes down to it, the financial markets in the U.S., uh, it's, it's global. Hmm. People are paying attention to the U.S. markets. And so we don't necessarily need to, this is not, we're not going into China talking about the Chinese markets. Hmm. Um, we're talking about the U.S. markets. So tell us about that. I guess I didn't realize that. So there are a lot of folks outside the U.S. that are actually trading Online. In so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people in different countries. Some are actually allowed to have um, U.S. accounts, mm -hmm. uh, like people in Mexico, right? There's there's others that uh, you actually need to be a broker dealer in that country. However, they're actually learning from us. So all of our content. This is probably a really important thing that I should say. All of our content's free. Anybody can watch it. Um, I mean, we have thousands of hours of video on demand. Um, and the uh, trading platform, even if you're in another country and you can't trade on it, I mean, you can do so many other things. You can actually, uh, we have more of a, I'll call it a traditional um, education module in it called Dojo, where you can watch these, these short videos that um, 
communicate concepts in sort of an entertaining, fun way. And you can take interactive quizzes to make sure you understand that concept. At the end, you earn an option certificate that you can actually uh, give to your broker to kind of check that box off because there, there's a require, you know, there's multiple requirements um, to be able to trade options. And that solves the chicken and the egg problem of I've never traded options, but I want to trade options. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one aspect that they can still do. You don't need a, count, a, a, a brokerage account for that. Uh, we also have um, a wonderful, uh, I'll call it follow page, where you can actually follow real traders, real people, I'm one of them, <laughs> real traders in real time making real trades. And we put down the description and the, the rationale and the reasoning of, of why we're making that trade. Hmm. And so it's, not, it's, a, it's truly a learning educational tool that's not, um, you know, we're, we're not in it to go, hey, make a million dollars and write us a check for $10,000 for this education. I mean, we, we try to actually remove the word education, financial education from it, only because there's so many people in the industry that are, that, you know, out there touting, make a million dollars, come sign up with, for my class. And so we, we try to distance ourselves a little bit from that. Uh, so this follow page, I, I absolutely love. Um, of course, Tom's, Tom's trades we charge for. <laughs> <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. But he's on air mm -hmm. all day making these trades throughout the day, just constantly. So I'm on there. I'm probably making a dozen trades a week. And I have a day job. So that, that's the other thing, if I, if I can add to this, because this is one of those beautiful things. People spend way more time on Facebook, okay? Way more time on Facebook. Um, the stat is, I want to say, 42 minutes. In, in, a, in a day. 18 minutes on average, I think, is the, is the um, visit to Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account, by the way. <laughs> I have a dual account. Um, <laughs> but I, um, that one makes you money. <laughs> that one that makes one me money. That one doesn't. <laughs> um, but, it's, but that's an incredible stat. People spend 21 minutes um, on YouTube. Okay? I spend 10 minutes on Doe every day to check my positions, see what I want to do. I can keep it running in the background while I'm doing other things. It's not, it's not, it doesn't suck my time. I know what I need to do. We make it so simple for you that you can find trades really easily because again, we give this logical mechanical approach and um, it's, you know, it's easy to close out when I need to close it out. It's all visual. So, so that's, that's something that I've learned. I can spend 10 minutes a day. Now, somebody goes, well, I don't know yet. I don't have a finance degree. Well, you don't need a finance degree. You wouldn't be, you'd be amazed. We got pilots. We got college students. We got, you know, you'd be amazed at the gamut of, of different customers that, that we have. So, um, but, it's, but what's funny then, too, I have to share with you, it's not a requirement because I only spend 10 minutes, but I, um, our average time on site is two hours. I Whoa. mean, that's how engaged So that's absorbing the content on your site, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's amazing. It's one stat that we're incredibly proud of. If, if there is, and I, I don't mean to use an, what I think is an overused term, but disrupting or disruption, I mean, you've disrupted the online trading experience. I mean, how, how would you define that disruption, you know, compared to, say, even your previous experience at Thinkorswim or, mm -hmm. you know, old school TD Ameritrade or something? Yeah. What is the disruption? The disruption is, is um, I'll, I'll say, content and providing something that people can use. They can actually do something with it. They can actually, it, you know, the, the um, and entertain them, right? You, you, those, those two things, it's really the combination. It's not like, oh, we've just created the best widget ever. It's that whole experience. It's that 360 experience. And it's the, probably the best example that I can use is when you, um, when you watch CNBC or you watch you know, some sort of news program that's financial, a lot of times you, you end up stopping and going, okay, I have no idea what to do in my own portfolio though. And that's one of those things. It's like, it, it just give me something actionable to do from there. And so instead of us just serving up something actionable so that you don't know what to do next time, we actually serve up the logical mechanical approach that you learn how to approach any of those situations and you look for the same sort of thing. Now that's not sexy. It's not sexy to say, here's a logical mechanical approach. Right. <laughs> but guess what? It is, because the market changes every day. 
and you know what to look for and you can um, you can go in and all of a sudden start to maneuver the markets and all of a sudden start talking about implied volatility rank and actually know what it means hmm. and know that it can make you money. Is there, I, I, <laughs> it's incredible. I, I'm curious, like is there, I'm sure you have this, uh, analytics around how you're tapping into kind of a new, so you could convert people from another trading platform to your trading platform, but actually bringing in, you know, people that have never traded before. Oh my God, I'm so excited. It's like, I swear I didn't even like feed all these to you because these are the exact questions. We create active customers. We create that sort, that's also the differentiator. Many people are just like, you know, I provide a platform. I, you know, I have the best trading pl platform, da, 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 da. Well, we actually, because we teach you, because we help you get there, we actually, we create you as, a, as fina being financially confident, being able to be, call yourself and a do-it-yourself investor hmm. or a trader. Trader always sounds cooler, right? But I use do-it-yourself investor, so it's not so... Um, it's not so, you know, you don't feel like you're one of the traders on the floor, right? Or you have to wear a trading jacket. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it is. Or it's about creating. Stuff, whatever that is. And we used to say at Thinkorswim, actually, that we created active customers by our technology. We actually took what we learned there and, and wrapped that into some of the stuff that we learned at Tasty Trade. And then, of course, what we learned at Tasty Trade, we wrapped all of that, too, into dough. But it is. It's about basically that onboarding of teaching someone, empowering them to do it themselves is is teaching them how to fish, right? That's Rather awesome. than handing them the fish. Yeah. So um, there's this guy, Bill Gross. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know the name, but sure. he's the founder of Idea Labs. Um, so he did this thing, and I don't know if it was formal research, but he's been a part of 200 startups. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to know amongst those 200, you know, there are some that are very successful, moderately big time failures and so on, but what were the commonalities for the successful startups? And he looked at things that you would think of, like business model, mm -hmm. you know, the team, and so on. But surprisingly, at least to me, out of that five categories, timing came out number one. Everybody's gonna say team first, right? You always invest in the team and the team. Uh, the team was number two, mm -hmm. not far behind, but timing was number one. So tell us about how does timing fit into what you guys are doing? Yeah, yeah, huge, huge, right? I talked a little bit about Thinkorswim. Right during the online trading, uh, you know, online trading era, I'll call it, right? Right after the web and the internet came out and then uh, online trading. And I have this wonderful slide I do in presentations to show the difference of what the trading platform looked like there. And I actually lived through that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the scary thing. Um, and then looking at what like Think or Swim looked like and then looking where like what we have too. So again, you know, starting out then, I mean that was that was amazing. And that was that was pre me. That was before I, I came on board with them. I came on board with them um, a few years after they first launched um, Think or Swim. But now with Tasty Trade and Doe, again, that this is that that um, you know, timing mm -hmm. of going, oh my God, this is it just happened kind of at the same time, but it was about content, usable, actionable content, right? But also paying attention on what's going on, what changes are happening in the industry and around you. I mean, that one of the big things, remember when I, I, I think I just mentioned it earlier about, hey, we were thinking an online radio show. Well, d hmm. pay attention, everybody's you know, <laughs> in right. video. And then also pay attention to mobile, right? I mean, over the last four years, and last four years has been us, right? Four years ago, we, we started Tasty Trade, is um, that online growth in mobile, I don't know if you guys have looked at some of those stats, 400%, video consumption, 400% increase, okay? <laughs> and on top of that, tablet, 1,700%. Um, so it's not even just about the video consumption, it's how they're you know, they, all of us, um, the world, is consuming that content. So it's about being highly mobile, right? And I feel like I've talked about mobile for a number of years, and, um, you know, it's just expected. It's just expected. You know, and you talk to millennials about mobile, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, That's it's, it. It's, it's like it's, it, I mean, that, that they're native to it. That's what they grew up with. We didn't grow up with that. 
Anybody have one of those really big, thick cell phones, like the brick? Anybody? I had one. I had one. <laughs> yeah, I totally did. Yeah. The <laughs> and the Motorola flip phone, you know, the old school one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it didn't have a wonderful screen that, you know, your kids can play games on and <laughs> that you can <laughs> trade on. I actually, uh, just anecdotally, tonight I was showing somebody Doe.com, and I had not been on the site on my phone. I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Do, do you guys, I'm sure you do, but stats around, so there's one side consuming the content that you have, but actually trading. Yeah. Um, what are those stats? I mean, you don't have to share it, but what do those stats look like actually using a mobile device yeah. to make trades? Yeah, well, so I'll share a couple things with you. Um, you know, one of the things that in, with our shows, one thing I didn't mention about Doe is that we also have Doe TV, where you can actually watch as well. So that's another module for the kind of that 360 experience. But, um, but what I'll say in the trading industry as a whole, you have where there are 50% of some trades being done on, on mobile. Wow. Okay? That's crazy. That's crazy. So it depends on what firm you yeah. know, you're looking at and, and, and. But it's um, it's one of those things that this is this this trajectory around mobile is is taken off. Now the the other thing I'll say is um, for us we it's a combination, right? We have this remember we have like the biggest marketing problem ever: millennials all the way to retirees, beginning to advance. I mean, it's a it's a crazy you know it's a it's a crazy wide world to yeah. try to to appeal to all of them because we have some customers that are literally at home watching this all day long. We have other people who are literally watching it only mobile. So it's mm. a, you know, for us, it's, a, it's difficult to kind of wrap in exactly how they're doing it. So we're, you know, we're delivering it all different ways for, for all the different types of customers. Very cool. So why don't we uh, open it up for questions? Yeah. Cool? Yeah, right there. And CRM meaning customer relationship management. Um, you know what? It's it's all about even even a startup. And depending upon what your product is, it's it's getting that feedback out of the gates. You know, one of the other things about getting your product out there and launching your product for the first time, being out there getting feedback. You know, as you launch, like get it out there. Don't make it perfect. Don't worry about having it be. You know exactly how you need it and want it. You want the customer feedback. You want to start that by having conversations. You want to start that by, by giving that sort of access and, and requesting feedback right away, whether it's through emails, whether it's through social, whether it's directly on your, on your website, right, or directly through your app. It's, it's all about creating that from ground zero. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, there's actually, um, I had a guest here and they talk, he talked about when they build solutions, they actually try to make them as ugly as possible so that if they'll understand immediately what's right and what's wrong mm -hmm. about the solution. Yeah. So anyway, more questions. Yeah, my, own, my own personal coming. portfolio, and you can see it on Doe. Actually, we don't. Show, we show every single trade. We show the opening trade. We show the closing trade. But you know what? I would say that. Um, so we actually give risk factors, like whether we're a one, two, three, or four, in um, on Doe. So you just kind of flip our tiles over, and it'll show you um, basically the level of account that we have. Uh, you know what? I I like to take risks. Okay. I I have. I'm a three on that meter. I'm not a four or four and a half, which is Tom. <laughs> but it's but I'm I'm like a three. I'm not I'm not ultra conservative. I'm not. Um, although I started out in accounting and I used to wear pale pink nail polish and only one inch heels and navy blue suits. Um, I quickly broke out of that. Um, but it's I would say that I'm a little bit more of a risk taker. Um, but I you know when I go in and I do a strategy. I might choose a strangle, which is a little bit riskier. It's not like if you do an iron condor, and I, it, it's defined risk. So we have um, undefined, and we have defined risk. Uh, but the, the trade that I'll do, I dial it on dough to be an 80% probability of profit, okay? 
So I'm not playing in the 60% range of probability of profit, but I, I widen mine. So I'm, I still consider myself a little bit riskier, but yet I'm going for a higher probability of success. I might take a smaller return on capital because I'm, I'm looking for that higher probability of winning, okay? Um, but anyway, I hope that answers your question. I'll give you a really roundabout yep, answer on uh, that. Right here. Well, diversification is, um, it's not like I'm going and, uh, uh, I'm not looking at all these f different products per se, but what I do do is I diversify in the way that I'm, I'm looking, I don't, um, I don't trade underlyings that are, are highly correlated, okay? So generally, I'm not gonna go do um, I'm generally not going to go trade, you know, whatever, XOP for oil and then go, you know, trade another. Okay, so, so you, try to, you try to spread it out in that way. And we have some really cool tools in relation to showing you what's correlated and what's not, um, which is also, because that's, that's been a question over time. We actually, we didn't, we didn't create that out of the gates. We, we actually created that later from a lot of customer feedback, too. Um, so, so they were also partners with us at Thinkorswim. And so one of the things that all of you guys probably know is, is VCs, private equity, um, they, they invest in people, right? I mean, they invest in ideas, but they invest in people too. So yes, they've seen us, um, you know, been there, done that. We made a really lot of money for them and, you know, so coming back again, but they also understand the space. Mm -hmm. They understand that, that idea of creation and education and what that does for, for the end customer and the lifetime value of them, right? And the ability to preserve their capital and, and, and. So all of those things, they understand that sort of trajectory. Um, and so that's part of what they invested in. They also invested in, in, in the idea of, of the content behind it and seeing some of the trends as well. So, so I think all three of those factors, you know, played into it. All right, two more questions. Oh, boy. Two more questions. We'll go here. Ah, <laughs> see, I was waiting for that question. Very Business good. <laughs> so um, while we're a financial media company, and we're a technology company. Uh, we, we overarching, we're a content marketing firm. So we actually lead generation of sending accounts to a brokerage firm, but we don't, we're not a hard sell. It's, it's content marketing. We're providing the content. If they want to use the platforms that we're using on air, um, they can open a brokerage account. And so we get paid for that, not tick for tick. Again, regulated industry, we can't get paid, okay, for every trade. So if somebody goes, oh, you're teaching them to trade small trade off, and it, we, don't get, we don't get an extra dollar every time somebody makes a trade. It's, there's a holistic um, uh, way we get paid because we distribute our content as well. Um, on top of that, so, so basically syndication, advertising, sponsorships uh, is all part of it too. All right, cool. We're going to stop it there. And let's give it up for Christy.